imagine a, a continent, a land that for a quarter of the year doubles in size. A land that is so inhospitable that the greatest percentage of humans who've ever set foot there have died out of any continent on Earth. A land so massive and dry and cold and dark and terrifying that it is moving imperceptibly but constant. Now, 30 centimetres a year doesn't sound like a lot. What can 30 centimetres a year do? And the answer is maybe kill us all. In 1986, an uh, iceberg the size of Luxembourg, 17,000 square kilometres, carved off of the Filchner Ice Shelf and landed in the Weddell Sea. And the coastline of Antarctica was barely changed. 72 degrees, 50 minutes and 16 seconds south, 106 degrees, 50 minutes and 5 seconds east, is the polar cold spot where the coldest natural temperature on Earth was recorded negative 88 degrees. That's Celsius, none of this from Fahrenheit, right? <laughs> Real cold. And there, a research station was built. In 1956, the Russians built a research station and they called it Vostok, which means east in Russian. So says Google Translate. And they built this research station to conduct experiments. Now, what kind of experiments would you need to conduct in the Arctic, in the Antarctic? What kind of experiments would you need to conduct miles and miles and miles away from the prying eyes and supervision of international bodies and, and any kind of bureaucratic oversight? What kind of, I mean, science investigations, right? There's legitimate reasons, okay? <laughs> and specifically, ice core drilling. Now, ice core drilling is really remarkable. You get a huge machine, and the first of these drills were about the size of a tin of soup. And you have a diamond encrusted blade, which you need to change pretty regularly, because even though you're only going through ice, you are going through miles of ice. And it spins at hypersonic velocities, and it plunges deep down into the ice, and it goes down. And it goes down for meters, tens of meters, hundreds of meters, sometimes thousands of meters. The first of the ice core drilling that we did went about 400 meters down. That's the height of the Empire State Building, straight down. And it pulled up a pocket of ice in which were frozen gases and isotopes of oxygen that could be analyzed to tell us what the atmosphere was like when this ice was on the surface 10,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago, 800,000 years ago, and over the millions of years that we have lived on this planet, over the eons and the ages, the, the different epochs have been charted in ice, a history that lies there waiting to be discovered. And at the true polar cold spot, Vostok Station was built and they started to dig. Well, they dug 400 meters, but that barely scratched the surface. They dug 1,000 meters, a quarter of the depth of the sea. But they weren't done. By 1994, they had gone 2,222 meters down, and the scientists were convinced that there was something else down there, something unknowable. Antarctica is the least explored continent. You can't use thermal imaging down there. Your sensors come back with a great big fuck you. You can't do, you, you can't trick the Antarctic. It is cold and it is near impossible to explore. But what we do know is that labyrinthine networks of caves filled with salt water and fresh water rupture and ripple and spread fractally under the ice for hundreds of thousands of miles. 
And throughout human history, there have been reports of things that live and emerge and return to the hidden world under the Antarctic ice sheet. Well, Lake Vostok in 2012 had a malfunction, an accident. Their drilling machine broke, and it broke in a very interesting way in that it got stuck on and pushing and going down and down and down. And though the blades broke, the machine kept pushing and digging deeper and deeper than it had ever gone before, past 2,500 meters, past 3,000 meters, past 3,500 meters, until at 3,700 meters, almost the entire depth of the Earth's oceans, they punched into a subterranean lake. Lake Vostok. Anton Padalka was one of the scientists that went down to investigate. Chance of a lifetime. Chance of hundreds of lifetimes. One of the amazing things about this lake, if you know anything about Antarctic exploration, I can see we have a couple of experts in the room, <laughs> you shouldn't be able to use scuba equipment. I won't bore you with the details, but the pressure and the cold and the density, but you can in Lake Vostok, the saline content and the, like I said, I won't bore you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so the team who were ice core experts, not explorers, who had a few scuba suits and a few bathyspheres built in the 1800s that the Russians had given them because the you know, Russians didn't have a lot else, dug the tunnel widened it out enough for a person to move down and began the process in a diving bell, going down 1,000, 2,000, 3,700 meters to the ice shelf above Lake Vostok. Well, Anton Padalka led his team, and they established a base camp, and they set up a perimeter. There was one person left up in the station to radio for help if anything went wrong, and let's hope nothing went wrong, because help would be a long time coming because we are, after all, pretty far from civilization. So Anton Padalka, in his incredible neoprene thermal scuba suit with the rest of his team and their huge bulky radios and their massive underwater cameras designed to flash and capture snatches of light and bring information back to the surface about the creatures that might exist, about the things they could find, headed down into a lake inside a continent at the bottom of the ocean nuts, if you ask me. <laughs> well, they went down and they found that Lake Vostok, by the <laughs> occasional flashes of camera light and sweeping beams of torches, they saw that this huge lake was like a long coiled serpent, not very wide, but extremely long. And it stretched for at least two miles in either direction. And so to cover more ground, the team split up. They realized after about half an hour that they weren't able to get in contact with each other. Not entirely unexpected. The brilliant light filtering down from the surface refracted off of the incredible crystalline structure of the ice shelf they were within, which made communication difficult at the best of times, scrambling their radios. But when they swam together, the three of them who were part of the team and looked, they saw that the huge radio apparatus they were carrying had been smashed. Wires torn out, plugs pulled asunder, sabotaged. Well, they turned and swam as a unit to try and get closer to the other two. But the other two didn't appear to be anywhere inside. So they started to map the cavern, to explore the lake, to check in with each other visually using hand signs. And then from round a rock on the other side of the lake, there came movement, movement that looked a lot like a, a scuba diver, somebody in scuba gear. Not, not exactly like the scuba gear that they'd had. The radio wasn't there for a start and the movement was strange, but clearly this was one of their missing divers. And so the team made their way underwater, bubbles escaping, trying to communicate with flashes and hand signs. And when they got within 100 feet of the moving scuba diver, the scuba diver expanded. 
and arms became tentacles. And the tank unfurled, and the creature's true form revealed itself. This was no scuba diver. This was a squid-like creature, 30 feet long. And it slowly pulled itself out with its tentacles and started moving towards the three remaining divers. Well, Anton Padalka hung back, but his two friends were less lucky. He saw something moving through the water like a cloud dispersed. Ink, you'd imagine, from a typical squid, but this was translucent, still very much there. And as the cloud expanded and hit his two friends, they started to paddle with a beatific smile on each of their faces as the creature's tentacles tendrilled out and wrapped themselves around his friends and began to pull them apart. Arms and heads and limbs slowly fed into the huge maw that appeared in the center of the beast. Well, Anton Padalka got out of there as quickly as he could. He swam to the hole in the ice shelf, pulled himself up and panting and gasping and freezing. He gestured to the one remaining diver who was down there and he said, we have to go, we have to get out of here now, we have to radio for help, there's some kind of terrible creature up there. And so they did. They took the big radio they hadn't brought into the water with them, the radio that hadn't been sabotaged, that hadn't been destroyed, and they sent out a distress signal. The distress signal bounced up 4,000 meters. The distress signal hit the big antenna a receiver on Vostok station and it was broadcast all across the Antarctic and there was no response no response even though it was picked up by at least three different stations well down on the ice shelf Anton Padalka was arguing arguing with Mary whose surname I honestly don't remember and I wish I did but Mary was the other surviving member of the team, and he was saying, we have to get out of here, we have to leave. And Mary said, no, we have to take proof with us. We have to get something, we have to get a photo, we have to get some kind of evidence that we can show people about what we found down here. And so against his better judgment, and because, you know, otherwise the movie ends, <laughs> Anton Padalka allowed Mary to convince him but Anton said, you know, Mary, I think that whatever this creature emitted, whatever cloud was spreading through the water was some kind of a toxin. Because as soon as it hit the two divers, it went straight through the skin of their wetsuits and they were transfixed, unable to move, unable to defend themselves. What we need is not this newfangled scuba technology. What we need are these bathyspheres. What we need are these ancient hulking culks. And so the two of them got into these unwieldy, rusting, bulbous units that would not let water touch them at all. And they descended with swiveling lights once more into the darkness and the cold of Lake Vostok. Well, soon the cloud appeared, strange yellow particulate that spread towards them, heralding the arrival of the creature, the creature that they would later call Organism 46B. <laughs> well, Anton was right. <coughs> the strange toxin that this creature released stopped at the edge of their ancient rusting suits, and the two of them were able to head towards it. A giant camera was raised, this thing two foot wide with a great big muzzle that flashed brightly, getting the creature's attention. And eight eyes and ten limbs and a big, sharp set of teeth around a gaping, more like mouth headed straight towards <laughs> Anton Padalka. Well, Anton Padalka drew a knife unwieldy as it was, because he was in a very hard to move in suit, and he tried to do battle with a creature. Well, we all know what it's like when you're trying to do battle with a giant squid in an underwater <laughs> lake in ancient Russian breathing apparatus. It's a fair fight, but it's not easy. <laughs> and he just about managed to slash one of the creature's long tendrils, one of its long suckered tentacles off of the main body, and it 
flapped and swam and the creature retreated with what I'm sure would be a horrible eerie shriek, but of course it doesn't make any noise. And so it disappears once again into the gloaming, into the gloom, into the depths. And Anton and Mary grab the tentacle and drag it, beleaguered and panting, up onto the ice shelf. Now, the diving bell is not quite ready to take them back up to the surface. It is recharging and it will be a couple of hours. And so they drag something over the hole. They open up a long steel Samsonite case. They pull the horrible kind of Jim Henson prosthetic into the case. They slam it down, they latch it shut. Getting out of their scuba apparatus, they get ready to try and get some sleep. Anton Padalka is woken by some thumping sound. He sits up in the dark and looks around. It is cold. His clothes are fusing to the ice upon which he's sleeping unwisely. <laughs> he looks around. Mary, he says. <laughs> he hears. And he turns on a torch and swings it around to see that the tentacle has made its way out of the box and crawled itself along the ice and strangled Mary in her sleep. So Anton Padalka stabs the tentacle up and he slams it back in the box and he says, why did we wait for this thing to charge? So he grabs the box and drags it into the diving bell and he, I don't know how diving, pulls himself up. The diving bell takes him all the way up to Vostok Station and he gets to the top of Vostok Station and he tries desperately to send out a radio frequency and he finds that the comms have been jammed. And pretty soon he hears the whirring sound, the whirring sound of hovercraft, which is how you move across the Antarctic sheets. And he sees five bright orange hovercraft approaching with Marines in snowy fatigues and men in black suits, and that's the noise with which they approach. <laughs> and the Russian, the Russian secret service has turned up, and they start debriefing him and asking him questions, and they ask him questions about the creature in the lake, and they seem to know an awful lot about it. They said, did it have eight limbs or ten? And he said, how did you, I didn't get to tell you. And um, the color of the toxin that it released, was it yellow or green, would you say? And he began to realize that they may not be the first to encounter this creature and that his team may have died for nothing. And he says to these people who have taken all of his photos, who have taken all of their findings, who have taken all of the ice cores and who have taken the tentacle onto the hovercraft, he says, are you, are you, going, are you going to kill me because of what I know? And the Russians laughed and said, of course not. Of course we're not going to kill you. The Antarctic will do that for us. And they got on the hovercrafts and they departed, leaving Anton Padalka alone, 4,000 miles from the nearest station, 3,500 meters from the nearest creature. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you.